Hey there, Extra Historians. Welcome to Lies, the part of the show where we tell you all the things we got wrong, the stuff we left out, and how we find out that the real empire was the pocket chicken we ate along the way. I'm Rob Rath. I'm the head writer of Extra History, and today we're talking about the empire of Brazil. So let's jump in real quick and get to everything. First of all, Lies is made possible by our wonderful Patreon patrons. Thank you so much. Uh, we would not be able to do Lies without you uh, because it's a it's a a kind of down week, um, but I, I, I really think it's an important part of the show. So thank you very much for letting us letting us do this. Recommended reading for this week is Brazil: A Biography by Lila M. Schwartz and Heloisa M. Starling, A Concise History of Brazil, Second Edition by Boris Fausto and Sergio Fausto, Every Inch a King: A Biography of Dom Pedro the First, First Emperor of Brazil by Sergio Correa de Costa. This is a book written in 1950, so it's not super up to date with kind of current thoughts about Brazilian history, but it's a very readable telling of some of the major events if you're just interested in that. Just know that you should probably supplement it with something a little more crunchy. We are partners with CuriosityStream and Nebula. If you have CuriosityStream, there is a really excellent documentary called Rio the Great Saga, which pairs very, very nicely with this series. Uh, it's has a little bit about the empire, but it's mostly about just Rio, the city as a whole, and uh, it's fascinating. Talking about a few general things, we have a patron question from Strong Cooper. Pedro II seems to be remembered in a highly positive light by history, which makes sense considering a lot of the things he did, but where does history find fault with him? So this comment came in before we hit episode 5, and we go into it a bit there, which is that uh, he was personally very well liked, but, you know, he sort of becomes an absentee king in the latter part of his reign. He's a very good leader, but he's also just a bit aloof. Uh, he doesn't necessarily take an active hand uh, in rule. And uh, even, you know, his biggest, his most famous thing, right, the Golden Law, he just sort of leaves it for his daughter to announce. Uh, he, like, signs off on it and is like, all right, bye. Have fun abolishing our, like, final bit of slavery. Um, so he's probably correct that the monarchy might not have uh, successfully gone to his daughters, even though legally uh, it could have. And he was probably right that the, the monarchy was on its way out. But I personally find it hard to look at his outlook and not see some of like the history of depression uh, that is clearly very evident uh, in his line and, and that uh, many members of his family struggled with. So I don't know if things were necessarily as bleak as he saw them. Um, but overall, yes, he's, he's, he's still very, very well loved in Brazil. Uh, someone wanted to point out, uh, or I, I wanted to point out, the Braganzas are a bit weird to try and understand because people around them lie about them a lot, and they lie about themselves a lot. Uh, so there are multiple stories, for example, of what Pedro did and said when declaring independence. We have like three different versions that are roughly similar but differ in a lot of key details uh, to the point doesn't feel like people are describing the same scene. Uh, we'll talk a little later about John's personal habits and what they may or may not say about him, uh, or if they were exaggerated by people around him. And uh, the scene where we talked about Pedro I beating his father John and John saying, I'm going to leave you as the emperor because if Brazil declares independence, at least it will be for you and not for one of these adventurers. That comes from a letter <laughs> Pedro wrote to John after the event saying like, remember when this happened? And it has a little bit of a feeling about it that like he might be rewriting history a little bit, but we only have his side of the correspondence. So maybe John wrote back and we're like, you're crazy. That didn't happen. Or like, th that is the, I do not remember saying that. So we just have Pedro's word to take for it. But there's a lot of things like that in, um, in, in this period of Brazilian history, especially with Pedro. He seems to have stage managed a lot of things, uh, Pedro the uh, First, like, I will stay. It seems that he said this multiple times uh, in different contexts. Uh, great comment uh, on the YouTube that I did not uh, know when I, when I put this up for vote. Uh, it's the 200th anniversary of Brazilian independence this year. So happy, happy bicentennial, uh, Brazil. And I'm really glad that we got to do this series in advance of that. And I just wanted to point out, the reason I have this here is normally in a history of Brazil, you would ha hear a lot, a lot, a lot about coffee, but we already have a coffee series. So I was like, eh, we don't have to talk too much about coffee this time. Episode one, 
patron question from Marina de Morris. This is more of an anecdote than a correction or question. She talks about how when the royal court came in and they started taking over people's houses and just sort of like kicking them out and it's like, ah, we need, we have a court minister who needs to live here. Bye bye. Uh, they would paint PR on their front doors. This was an abbreviation for the Prince Regent. Uh, but locals tended to mockingly read it as put yourself out in the streets, essentially like making, making you homeless. Uh, and she sent a really great article that mentions this story and also points out that only a few landlords owned 23% of Rio property at this time. And they became just fabulously wealthy uh, during this period when the court was just renting out everything they possibly could because suddenly uh, Rio, which was not big at the time, had the highest rental uh, values in the entire Portuguese empire. We also had a Brazilian viewer talk about the same thing, but claimed that the PR standard for royal property, whereas the joke was stolen property. These two things can essentially coexist and like be the same story with slightly different details. And for all we know, you know, people made multiple jokes about what PR meant. We had some a great comment. It's fun fact, the Portuguese royal family arrived in Brazil. The women hid their bald heads due to the lice outbreak with turbans and unintentionally started a fashion craze among the middle and upper classes in Brazil for wearing turbans. Yeah, it's hard to overemphasize how unbelievable it was for Brazilians to suddenly be looking at the monarchs of the Portuguese empire. This had never happened before with European royalty coming to one of their colonies. And they just know about them from these idealized portraits that are hanging everywhere. And then they see the actual monarchs and they're like, huh, you're kind of short and you have a lot of facial warts and look kind of weird, John. You look real weird. Like if you, I, if you want a fun, like fun thing, like go online and just look for portraits of John the sixth, there are no two of them that look alike. Like, and they all look kind of very odd and off-putting. <laughs> he was not like the kind of person that you would see in like a, a portrait and then meet him and be like, yes, very dashing Prince Regent, you know? Um, we did use the American spelling of Brazil with a, a B-R-A-Z-I-L rather than B-R-A-S-I-L. Often in Brazil, it's, it's, it's with an S. Uh, we often default to the uh, American standardized spelling um, it's just it's just sort of like an editorial thing we do. Um, also, I just wanted to point this out. I got this from that that documentary on Curiosity Stream. Rio de Janeiro means the River of January, and that's because when the Portuguese got there, they saw this big wide mouth bay and thought it was like a river delta. <laughs> so they they're like, this is we're here in January and it's a river. So this is now the River of January, and that is what we will call our city that we will found here and like give over to the Catholic Church. And uh, actually, there's no river there. There's a river like a while inland. And one of the first things they have to do is figure out how to put in enough aqueducts to actually supply the city with water uh, because it just doesn't have uh, enough fresh water. Episode two, YouTube question. Brazil's flag colors aren't about rainforest and gold like most people think. The green stands for the Braganza of Portugal and the yellow stands for the Habsburgs. Yes, we mentioned this a little bit in episode four. But green and yellow are Braganza colors. Uh, they were very heavily married into the Habsburg family. Um, but, you know, they get reinterpreted later on where it's like it's gold for the gold mines and, and green for the rainforests. Uh, when people are not so happy to tie themselves to uh, these, these deposed monarchs. Someone commented that the reason why John VI kept snacks in his pocket was because he was paranoid about someone poisoning his food. We kind of made fun of his pocket chicken, that he would keep hunks of chicken in his pocket to snag between meals. That is one explanation and is probably at least a little bit true. I just want to point out that John was a deeply, deeply weird individual in a lot of ways. Um, he would throw a fit and refuse to change his clothes. He had this one jacket, the chicken pocket jacket that is, you know, greasy from all this decaying chicken uh, that he'd wear for weeks on end, insisting that it not be washed or mended. He'd sleep in it, and it uh, it smelled terrible. He just, in general, often smelled terrible. And this was such a compulsive behavior that when he ripped his jacket, servants would have to sneak into his room while he was asleep with, like, needle and thread and mend it while it was still on his body and he was sleeping. I didn't go into this for a couple of reasons, partially due to time, and I think we get John across pretty well already, like no matter what. But also recent historians have pointed out that 
we don't know how true a lot of that is. Uh, a lot of people wanted to dogpile on John VI, especially after he died, about how terrible he was and how gross and, and just yucky he was. So probably this is overemphasized. There was also a film uh, a couple of decades back that was from the perspective of Carlotta Joaquina who, that really, really leaned hard into this. So it's something that historians are trying to, kind of trying to walk back and be like, no, this guy was very important and he could be very smart and, um, and able at times. Uh, and probably his personal habits were not as gross as has sometimes been portrayed. Um, so I, I wanted to not lean into that too much, but I couldn't leave out the pocket chicken. That's just too funny. I also wanted to mention that Pedro saying I will stay is a big deal in Brazil. It's known as Dia de Fico or I will stay day. It's not a holiday, but it's considered special. But he has also apparently said it multiple times in multiple places. So uh, this is one of those things that was probably a little bit stage managed. We had a couple of comments that Pedro I was favorable to the abolition of slavery and that he had a quote that went, I know uh, our blood is the same as, as theirs, that of the slaves. There's also a comment on his deathbed that he makes that uh, goes like this. Slavery is an evil and an attack against the rights and dignity of the human species, but its consequences are less harmful to those who suffer in captivity than to the nation whose laws allow slavery. It is a cancer that devours its morality. Now, not a very modern way of looking at it, right? That like, we, the slaveholders, are the ones who are really hurt by slavery even more than the people who are, who are enslaved in chattel slavery. But uh, I do want to say that, you know, a lot of the monarchs of the Empire of Brazil, I didn't give them a lot of credit for this because almost all of them say this kind of stuff in private, and then they do absolutely nothing with their power to try and fix the situation. So... I don't really want to give them like partial credit for this. Having said that, it's not a straight line thing. Episode three, patron question from Maz. Why did Pedro die? Natural causes or was he assassinated? Uh, he was a pretty healthy guy, except he did have epileptic seizures. Um, he died from tuberculosis that was caught fighting in Portugal. It's not really thought that he, that he was assassinated. Uh, there was suspicion of assassination with John. Uh, who went to have lunch at a monastery. After that, he starts vomiting. He has convulsions. It's suspected that he's poisoned when he dies, but nobody really looks into it. Nobody thinks of, like, nobody really unearths a culprit. Um, however, in the 1990s, he is tested, and they find he has twice the lethal level of arsenic uh, in his body. I'm always a little bit careful saying that that means someone was poisoned because in the 19th century, arsenic is just everywhere. It's in cloth. It's in wallpaper. It's it's in cosmetics and people are eating it as medicine. So like it could have been other things. But yeah, there is some suspicion that he was poisoned. Probably the the last plot by by his wife. <laughs> like um, as because we all saw how that went. YouTube question. Just so people from foreign countries know, Pedro the first is named Brazilians call him. To Portuguese people, he is in fact Pedro the fourth. This makes things complicated because Pedro II, his son and the Emperor of Brazil, could be mistaken as Pedro II of Portugal, who lived in the 18th century and was the fifth son of John IV. Yet things get complicated when a royal family just like runs away and decides to form a separate empire in one of their colonies. We had a great comment, a multi-hour long bottle throwing war? Guys, you can't just drop something like that and then carry on without elaborating. So in November of 1830, there's this uh, liberal Italian journalist who is part of the Brazilian party who denounces Pedro I, and he's assassinated by agents sent by the Portuguese party, which is allied with Pedro. This is part of what leads to the escalating series of street protests and people picketing uh, Pedro's speeches and shouting over him, you know, uh, uh, constitution and abdicate. Um, but then on February 13th, 1831, uh, Pedro goes to Minas Gerais, and the Portuguese party decides to have this big reception for him. So it's this wonderful party that the Brazilian party attacks with rocks and bottles. They just storm in and start throwing bottles at everyone. So the supporters of the Portuguese party grab all their empty bottles and start throwing them back, and just supporters of both sides flood the streets and just, like, throw bottles at each other for several hours in a... Uh, in a night that has the wonderfully descriptive name, quote, the night of the bottle fight. 
Uh, and this was a major factor in Pedro's abdication two months later. Episode four, YouTube question. Uh, it's a shame that you couldn't talk about our series of revolts. They're amazing tales. Yes, they are super fascinating. One thing I wish I had put in earlier, because I didn't really know if it was going to be such a um, recurrent theme, was that a lot of these revolts in the north are centered around Pernambuco. Uh, one of the things that upset them is before John came, the capital had moved to Rio, but John's first stop in Brazil is uh, in the north, and they're like, oh, he's come to Bahia. Bahia is going to be the capital again. He's going to move the capital back. And then he like is like, no, that's okay. Sorry, we're going to Rio. And then they all get in the ships and they go down to Rio. Um, and everyone gets really mad. <laughs> like, so um, a lot of people said the Paraguayan War deserves its own series. Yes, one reason I kind of talked around it a little bit is so that at some point we could circle back and, and do a series on it because there is a lot uh, to cover there. We had a wonderful comment from a historian. I love it when historians decide to comment on our episodes. He points out the Brazilians had a problem with the government, but not with the emperor. Uh, he was a really respected figure. He represented the nation, and people were proud of him, which is why they decided to make the boy, Pedro II, the emperor as soon as possible. People actually wanted to have an emperor. That desire to have an emperor actually dates back to an old Portuguese messianic math called Sebastianism. The emperor would go on tours all over the country visiting cities, and believe me, those visits are remembered to this day. He talks about how... When he's worked in Brazil, these small towns still talk about and celebrate the time the emperor visited our city and that this is the major event uh, in the history of this town. Uh, yeah, Sebastianism is super fascinating. To do a very short version, it's a, it's a sort of Arthurian king sleeping under the mountain myth. So King Sebastian of Portugal in 1578, he's 24 years old, he decides he's going to invade Morocco. It's a giant disaster, and he gets killed, and nobody can find his body. Like, that's how bad it is. The, the Portuguese army just gets horribly routed, and they can't even find where the king has been killed. Um, so he disappears, and for centuries there are these rumors that he's going to come back and found a new Portuguese empire. And that's what people start talking about when John goes to Portugal. It's like, ah, this is, the, this is going to be the remaking of the Portuguese empire in, in, uh, in Brazil. Episode 5. Uh, did Pedro II losing his two sons at an early age sour him on the monarchy? A lot of people pointed this out. They said that they lived, they, there's a lot of Brazilian viewers that said that what they learned was that Pedro II's two only sons dying very young uh, soured him on the monarchy and was like kind of the final straw uh, and made him feel like the monarchy would end with him. I'm a little skeptical of this just because I think that was one thing in a long series of incidents. He never liked being emperor in the first place. I mean, there's something to be said about being the only monarch in the Americas that, like, it seems pretty lonely. You know, like, exactly how long is this going to go on when you're, you're visiting the United States and meeting President Grant and kind of seeing what has happened to all the other monarchs or formerly monarch-governed uh, territories? So I think it's a number of things... Um, but he just he just did not like the monarchy at all. Uh, one story that we skipped over that I really wish we could have done is uh, when he meets his wife, Teresa Cristina of the two Sicilies, it's this horrible, horrible event, which they've already been married by proxy. He's absolutely in love with this woman who's been talked up to him, and he's seen these beautiful portraits of her. You can see where this is going. Her ship comes. Uh, it's a Brazilian fleet that's been sent to pick her up. Uh, she's supposed to get off the ship to meet him. He can't wait any longer. He storms aboard the ship, and the a cr watching crowd is, like, cheering at, like, this display of bravado. He meets her, and he's so deeply disappointed he can't hide it. Um, she's just a very, like, normal, you know, looking woman. She's, you know, she just doesn't look like this very idealized beautiful like portraits that he's been sent uh she's she has a slight limp when she walks um and he essentially like storms out and uh goes to his bodyguard and his nanny who have basically been a surrogate mother and father figure this whole time and just just cries for hours and swears he's not going to marry her and that they need to send her back and undo it, 
and they essentially talk him into like no this is like this is a done deal like you need to marry her that's it um they actually end up having a pretty good relationship sadly she like falls in love with him at first sight basically they have an okay marriage considering like he's just not really super invested just seemed like the monarchy was torture for everyone involved like as this was going on a lot of people point out that his um his travel was supposed to be for uh clearing up some respiratory issues you had and that he was sick um yes that is the reason that is given along with his first trip is to see his uh daughter's grave but his travel schedule is real intense for someone who is supposed to be you know so sick they have to go abroad and you know rest up he does a lot he travels to a lot of places in a very short period of time so i don't know how much that holds water i think it, i i read it as kind of an excuse uh it's not necessarily that it wasn't true but it's like okay great there's a reason that i can get out of here you know one of the key military officers that helped stage the coup was a good friend of pedro ii and he didn't realize the plan was to abolish the monarchy so he he's the one who like seizes the capital and then he hears secondhand that like they've established a republic and they're gonna oust the emperor and he's like whoa what i thought we were just gonna like get rid of some politicians we didn't like and everything was just gonna like go on and that's what pedro thought too to the point where he's coming in in a carriage he's basically like eh, i'm gonna come in i'm gonna like inaugurate the new government and be like great i'm gonna go back to my house you know in the countryside and instead he gets forced out of he's like put him on a ship and ship into france i did want to mention i was so upset to have to cut this out but right before the coup there was this big ball this is like the week before and all of the plotters are there and pedro the second is there and they're all like laughing it up like nothing's going to happen and this ends up being like sort of the send-off of the empire of brazil uh but as pedro ii who's quite old at this point is getting out of his carriage he starts walking up the stairs and he trips and a bunch of footmen jump forward to try and catch him he manages to catch himself on his cane and he waves them off and says quote do not worry the monarchy may stumble but it never falls Ooh, chilling <laughs> so with that leaving at that coming up on extra history we've got the history of beer which uh we're actually going to talk about this brewery uh polliner from munich it's going to be a really fun series it's going to be different from what we usually do uh after that it's tulip mania so it's a bizarre fun like uh bubble economy kind of series about a bunch of people paying way too much money for tulips and then losing out quite a bit and then it just got voted through the Ethiopian Empire, and we're going to focus on the Solomonic Dynasty. This is a group that uh, claimed to be descended from King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. They claimed to possess the Ark of the Covenant, and they were in control of the Ethiopian Empire from 1270 to 1975, uh, including, you know, fighting crusades against Muslim neighbors and uh, defeating attempts at European colonialism. It's going to be a really cool series. You're going to really enjoy it. So uh, keep an eye out on our channel. You never know when we're going to drop a one-off or sponsored episodes. How'd you like the Mary Toft episode? She's one of my favorite uh, stories from, from 18th century London, which is my favorite place and favorite period. I just want to point out that she's running around at the same time as like Jonathan Wilde and Jack Shepard and Henry Fielding and all these people from our, uh, our Policing London series. Uh, just a wild very instructive story when it comes to medical history um and just what people how people used to think women's bodies worked for ibn Battuta's side trip let's talk about brazil's most famous cultural event carnival we were actually supposed to shoot this episode on uh march 1st which was fat tuesday but uh due to covid related situations we had to be a little bit late that is why i have not had my hair cut um but i really wanted to put the story of carnival in the episode somewhere i didn't get the chance but it actually predates the empire. So Carnival arrived with immigrants from the Portuguese island. Uh, Portuguese islands is this pre-existing tradition of having a big blowout before Lent. Mardi Gras is very similar. Um, so it first one occurs in Rio in 1723, where these groups just go out in the street and start like throwing water at each other and also mud and food. And unsurprisingly, it starts a riot. So they're like, that was fun. Let's do it again next year. Um, by the time of the Empire of Brazil, things had become a little more official. So you have these masked costume balls, groups of aristocrats and court figures uh, joining some small parades and masks. 
By the 1850s, they have these horse-drawn parade floats and military bands. There are performances of coconut dances, which is a form of music borrowed from the enslaved people. Uh, however, Afro-Brazilians are often banned from these parades, but they often take part anyway. It's just like you can't really stop 100 people who decide to get together and be at a parade. So um, the big change comes in 1917 when samba music, uh, an Afro-Brazilian Afro music form uh, created by enslaved people, first joins the carnival in 1928, the first samba schools uh, dance in it. And um, a few years later, like, Samba is the official music of Carnival, and you have Carnival looking like it does now with the floats and the parades and uh, and and the Samba dancers. Uh, so, yeah, I can't really think of a better... It's a little bit late, but happy Carnival. I'll see you next time for the History of Beer. The biggest easy thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Angela Valenciana, Casey Muscha, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kyle Murgatroyd, and Orioles One for being fantastic legendary patrons. 